Hey, Leon, how you doing, mate? I'm doing really well. You look just like a friend of mine. For a moment, I was like, is that Andrea? <laughs> but it's not. But clearly, no. you're an Englishman. I am indeed. Yeah, I mean, a, 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 a half English, well, quarter English, quarter Scottish and half Indian, but born and raised in the UK, down in down in about 30 miles west of London, I grew up. What about you? Where are you from originally? Uh, I grew up in, in, uh, in London, yeah. in, in Hampstead. Nice and, part of yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, now I live in LA. Ah, good, good. Sonia. Yeah. It, it is indeed. It is indeed. So what's your name? I'm Ash. And Ash. Yeah, indeed. And I am uh, a, a, a Brit as you know, but my background is, well, I mean, I do travel journalism and filmmaking expedition stuff. Uh, I'm currently doing a master's in strategic communications as well. So quite a mix of things I'm doing at the moment, Leon. Okay. And uh, if someone were to say to you, what are you famous for? What would that be? Because if they were to say to me, Leon, what are you famous for? It would be the kindness diaries and traveling around the world yeah. on kindness. Uh, but what is your the flavor of ash? Um, I don't know. I think the thing that I enjoy the most is explaining complex things clearly. So I do work in broadcast bits and pieces on Radio 4. I have a column in t the Telegraph travel section, and I try and use travel as a route into uh, current affairs and social issues. That's basically what I use travel for. And I think that's that probably summarizes what I do fairly well. Um, run a video production company. But yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd say explaining complex things clearly is what I would be known for. So what are some of the... So are you a journalist? It sounds like you're a journalist of some sort. Yeah, so I'm a freelance journalist. I write for the um, Telegraph Times, City AM, start with Condé Nast Traveller, Wanderlust. So, you know, sort of broadsheets and the magazines uh, in travel. Um, do bits and pieces, as I said, for radio, um, hopefully off to India to do a project in India and Pakistan in April. That should be front of camera. Uh, and I teach journalism at the City University School of Journalism. But I never trained as a journalist and I never worked full time inside a journalistic organisation. I guess it's the, the storytelling element. And I do enjoy writing as well. So, yeah, I, I suppose that's where... Um, I do most of my work and probably what I know best for is the journalism. Okay, cool. And what kind of stuff do you write about? I know it's travel, but travel is, is, is wide. Kind of what angle do you take when it comes to travel? Yeah, so I think it's where travel is an intersection with other things. So if you've got travel and you're going somewhere like um, Sudan and telling, getting an understanding of how um, the social changes in that country are going on, what, what it's like to travel through Sudan, what the people are like there, but also how things like climate change are affecting Sudan or going through Uganda and exploring how the increasing use, uh, increasing corporatization by Chinese companies in there is having an, an impact on the social fabric of Uganda or how climate change is affecting the northern regions and what that means for people moving around and what that means for Uganda. And in 2018, I spent six months traveling along the uh, European border of Russia in and out. So I started in Norway, right up the top of the Arctic Circle, through Finland, uh, St. Petersburg, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Kaliningrad, Poland, Belarus. And then I went into Ukraine. Um, so I went to Kiev, uh, uh, Chernobyl, Lviv, ivano frankivsk and uh, the Carpathian Mountains, um, Odessa, uh, and then across to Donbass, uh, where the conflict had been raging for four years. I uh, stayed on the Ukrainian side, and then I got permission to go down into Russian-occupied Crimea. And the whole intent of that journey was to understand identity. How do people manipulate identity? How do they try and leverage it to create fractures within a country? Um, what kind of strategic communications and messaging do they use to amplify division or try and push people in the direction they want? 
um, and to really get to know the country. What was Ukraine? What was its identity? What was what was it to be Ukrainian? What was the challenges that they were facing uh, when at that time Putin was already trying to cut away pieces of Ukraine with his um, sort of birth culture, nationalist identitarianism? Um, so trying to get a feel for it and doing that through firsthand experience. And, and what did you learn about humans and their identity? Um, I realised that our beliefs are very much more vulnerable than we think they are. So uh, as an example, um, I went to a town called Novgorodska, uh, which has actually been renamed as its old name, its pre-Soviet name, New York, which is from there you could see Horlivka, which was in Russian, Russian controlled Donbass effectively, the Donetsk People's Republic as the rebels call it, and the the front line of, of Russian backed troops. And speaking to people there who had this identity challenge, you know, though Russian speaking, they had all this disinformation and propaganda coming across the border. But they were like, well, we like the life we have here. This is a very free place. We have choice, we have freedom, we can make our own way in the world. And they had relatives on the other side of the border who believe very different things. Um, and then I went down to Russian occupied Crimea, which has obviously had four years still as a police state. So one of the main differences of what happened after the revolution of dignity in 2014 is Ukraine dismantled its police state. Um, but in Crimea, I was in a, in a shop with my Russian Ukrainian translator, Artyom, and a woman overheard her speaking English, and she spent time in the north of England, got chatting to us. And uh, I told her that I was going back to Ukraine afterwards, and she said, oh, it's very dangerous there. They're, they're, they're killing all the Russians. And uh, Artyom said, what, what do you mean? She goes, well, you know, I've seen it on television. I said, I'm, I'm a, a Russian in Odessa, and I can tell you they're not killing people here. She said, well, clearly you've just been influenced by the propaganda. So there she had somebody telling her with first-hand experience what, what their life was like. But she had this belief that was so strong and so powerful as a product of what she'd been told. Uh, and it made me realise that if we just hear stuff a lot, it's very easy for that to become true by dint of hearing it. So I think we are probably um, less independent in our thinking than we like to believe. I think that's probably what I took from some of that. Wow, that's a, that's a powerful story. That's, that's like a first-hand story of how propaganda, whether it's in the West or whether it's not in, in the East, let's say, how it affects us, how it, affects, how it affected that specific human being and beyond. I yeah. mean, how do you counteract that? Um, so I think that the way to do that is to simply, you have to just tell truth and do it through examples. Uh, today on my masters, we were speaking to some of the uh, Ukrainian strategic communicators who are currently trying to uh, save their country, working alongside the president who's doing a great job of strategic communications. Uh, and they were speaking to their relatives in Russia who were saying things like, well, why are you fighting? Why don't you just join Russia, you know, you're led by neo-Nazis. And they're like, no, no, we we can tell you firsthand what's going on. You're not going to change that overnight, that enclosed space of really powerful influence that they have in Russia. So how do you how do you counter it? Well you develop critical thinking, allowing people to work out how to judge the information that they're receiving. Um, and you create a free and fair press, which doesn't exist in Russia, for example does exist in Ukraine, does exist over here. And, you know, propaganda is just the um, organised communication for influence. I think it's it's neither good nor bad. People do it. Um, but being aware that it's powerful and that you can change people's beliefs through it um, is critical. And, and teaching critical thinking, I think, is probably the best way to counter it. You know, the Finns, Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians have been doing that kind of work for a very long time because they have been at the front line of Russian um, information operations and they teach it from a very young age. And I think if you teach that skill of critical thinking, that's probably the best way to counter it. You know, I've been living in America for a long time and I've noticed that with the American news, 
it is becoming more propagandized, if that's even a word. Yeah. Whereby, if you're on the right, you will be told things that the people on the left will be like, this is just a completely opposite reality. And if you're on the left, vice versa. You see what I'm saying? And, and yeah. that, to me, is very worrying. I mean, you know, you grew up in England. You uh, were part of Europe until, well, you're still part of Europe, but not yeah. Brexit, whatever. Um, uh, we kind of grew up with the history of the Nazis, right? We, It's like ingrained inside of us because of of our, our history. And I think that we do have more critical thinking on some levels than in America. And it's very worrying for me to see what goes on in the news at 8 p.m. every night, at 7 p.m. every night. It's like, and it happens on the left as it happens on the right. I mean, maybe a little bit more on the right, but it it, it is, how can we stay together? As, as Abraham Lincoln once said, a divided house cannot stand. Mm. And now with the news of Ukraine, one of the things that I've noticed is that for the first time in years, both the left and the right are saying the same thing. Mm. And I'm watching the news and I'm flipping to from Fox News to MSNBC. And I'm like, you guys are basically saying the same things. Yet generally, they are attacking each other. How, how do you stop that? Is that even stoppable? So I think there's, uh, there's two critical things here. One is to try and find common ground with people. Uh, so it's very easy to write off people as lunatics and insane and uh, fascist uh, and just say, I won't speak to them. But I think finding common ground and then using that to share experience is important because you need to, even if you, there is a difference though. So if you look at the difference of what you had in like, 1990s American politics, um, people may have had different opinions on on tax regulation, um, sorry, on tax or, or regulation, but fundamentally they, they believed a, a central truth uh, and they believed in the democratic process and they believed in the peaceful transfer of power. I think what we have uh, seen in the last couple of years is something quite new. Uh, and I, I do think it exists more on the alt-right, by which I don't mean right-wing politics, but a new sort of insurgent movement that is leveraging the way liberal democracies work to effectively undermine them from within. I mean, we see this um, uh, people trafficking in in conspiracy theories, uh, dog whistling to uh, create coalitions of uh, with more extreme groups, um, whether that is you know, QAnon or even what Johnson was doing recently with regards to Keir Starmer and the Savile Inquiry in the UK. It's quite a niche thing, but it was basically leveraging a, a right-wing conspiracy theory. Um, and then he refused to apologise for it. So I do think there's something different in politics, which is an organised political methodology. Um, you know, people like Bannon, um, Orban, Rhys Mogg, and those have done a very good job working with people like Le Pen, and others to coordinate how to how to do this, which I think, coming back to how how do you deal with that? I think you have to recognise there are some people within um, democracies who don't have the best interests of democracies at heart, and who will will leverage the vulnerabilities in the democratic system, um, and they will seek to exploit that. So you know, as a how do the rest of us cope with that? You know, I think for those on the right who are sort of having their political parties undermine more than those on the left generally by these groups. I think it's a case of standing up and being honest about the things they can be honest about. Look, I believe this about tax. I believe this about uh, these social values, but I also believe in the democratic system and think that's important. And I think the only way you can do that is to build a coalition of understanding about the importance of truth. Uh, and that's where the bridge has to come between. Very, very wise words. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, truly, truly. It, it seems that, we started the conversation talking about travel. Yeah. And we've kind of like morphed into kind of politics. But you had mentioned how you were a travel journalist. So it's, are you a travel journalist? 
or are you a journalist who talks about human issues whilst traveling? I don't know if that made any sense. No, it does. And I, I think one of the, um, I, I think what I found through travel is um, using it as a lens through which to explore um, other topics, whether that's, you know, environmental change, politics, sh- social issues. Um, th- those are the main ones I choose to explore. And I think one of the things about travel is it forces you to question your own as- assumptions. So you might have an assumption about how the world works or how people view things, which is very different to how things are viewed in, in India and actually between the UK and the United States. Um, I think probably the UK has more in common with France and Germany than it does with the United States, despite the shared language, because you know a lot of the ideologies that found the two, the, the European nations and the American nations differ in some ways, or the way that we're structured. And I think by traveling, you end up understanding your own country better, and you have a better way to reflect on the things that you encounter. So, you know, if if, if I just think about travel journalism, it tends to just be writing. People think it's just writing about holidays or or hotel reviews. And certainly there's an element of that. Don't get me wrong, there's been some great trips I've been able to do through that. But I think using travel as a lens to explore things is a more powerful way to do travel journalism. Um, and and what if, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about me, but I've done a tremendous amount of traveling. Yeah. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount by going out into the world. And whenever I travel, part of that experience stays with me. For example, one of my first travels I ever did was in Nepal, and that never left me. That experience what, of Nepal, that like Nepal, what was it about Nepal that drew you in the first place? So, I was always interested in Mount Everest, mm. um, and I was interested in the royal family of Nepal, and I was interested in the Himalayas, and this was actually twenty years ago. Um, and that I just a, that was a very interesting time to be in Nepal in relation to the royal family as well. Yes, I know because the the crown prince killed his entire family, which yeah. is insane. Have you read the book? Something like white, a powerful book about that moment. I mean, it was just complete mm-hmm. insanity. Well, basically, what happened was that the crown prince killed the king, the queen, and multiple members of the royal family. Um, the the brother of the king took over, and within a couple of years because he wasn't liked. And within a couple of years, uh, it became a, 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 a republic, right? And they're still trying to work out the constitution, I think. Yeah, so it's crazy. But so th- that it's like part of the, the country stays with me. And I've learned so much from traveling. What is like some stories that you can share of life-changing stories that you experienced on the road that anyone who's listening may be like, wow, I need to go traveling. Well, I think I think that that journey through Ukraine really taught me a lot because I you you presume that place you have an idea of a place. Um, and then when you get there, those preconceptions are really shattered. Um, I've traveled through New Zealand um a, a couple of times, and I found that a really interesting country because of the the way you know, t- the way Maori culture and Pākehā culture, like white New Zealanders, uh, it intersects. And it's very different to the way it's, it exists in in other countries. So I think uh, if you come from a country like the United States or Canada, where they have a complex relationship with their indigenous people um, through the, you know, the genocides and the, the, the clearing of lands, it's interesting to go to a place like New Zealand where they have much more agency in the nation and they're much more prominent in the national identity. I mean, you go around New Zealand and the signs are in Maori uh, as well as being in, in English. Not everywhere, you know, not all the road signs are also in Maori because take up too much space in the road signs. But it's, um, I, I think that's an interesting place to go and see how that sort of thing exists and traveling around. New Zealand last time I went uh, down a river called the Wanganui with a Maori guide and the Wanganui is this very um, very important place in the mythology of New Zealand all of the landscape is based on the stories of gods and uh, getting into fights and carving the landscape and traveling down with this guy uh, and and as we went through he was a, he referred to the land and places around the land as if they were alive and they were a part of him 
And even if you don't take away from that, like the mythological idea, the the the, the separation that we have from land in our societies, our atomistic societies, our individualistic societies of the West, in particular, I mean, you, the United Kingdom is one of the most nature denuded places on earth. And, you know, you go out to the countryside, none of it's natural. It's been farmed for thousands of years. And I live in London. I don't have much connection with nature. And you kind of forget how that can shape your feeling every day, that, that affinity with nature and how just being a part of it can give you senses or, or as the Maori call them, like, you know, the, the, the mana, is that the word they use? You know, the spirit of the land. Um, so I found that a very powerful place to travel because New Zealand, you imagine it to be just like the UK. They play rugby, they play cricket, they put the Union Jack on their flag. And then when you go there and experience it, it was a very different thing. Um, so I found that a very potent experience. In Sudan, we walked out of the desert one day where a friend of mine was walking the entire length of the River Nile and I joined him for a bit. We walked out of the desert one day and, uh, we, you know, set, settled the camels down. And this guy walked over to us. He's like, you know, you've got to come and stay in my house. But, oh, we can't. We've got to stay near the near the camels. And he goes, OK, well, OK, cool. Just stay here. And then about 15 minutes later, he came back carrying his bed on his head. And so well, if you won't come to my house, my house will come to you. And he gave us his bed to lie on. And I think that idea of uh, welcoming and engaging with complete strangers is a really powerful lesson to take because it's something that we don't do that easy. We're not often interested in the people we meet, apart from what we can gain from them, rather than what we can give to them. And so I think that was something I took from Sudan. Mm. It seems also that you're a connoisseur of the human condition. Mm. And, and I think that traveling makes you that. Much like you. Yeah, much like me. I didn't want to say it. Yes, we're both connoisseurs of the human condition, right? Because when you travel, as you've said a few times, you experience things like the Indian person has a certain way to see the world. The British person has another way to see the world. The Swedish person has another way to see the world. Yet, at base, we are all the same, right? So it's like... A very interesting experiment to travel because you widen your perspective, you widen your horizon, you widen so much and you cannot but understand humanity better than if you travel. And you could argue, you could say, well, you know, what about if you travel to the middle of the Antarctic where there's no one? But then you're learning about yourself, right? So it, 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 it's kind of, I've always had this urge and this desire to understand people. And travel is the most profound way to truly understand people because you have lots of different types of people that are unique, yet ultimately exactly the same as you. Well, I think one of the other things that's quite important to take from that, so there's, there's two related things in that. One is, the way you travel like it's very easy to travel uh, and simply have a sort of consumerist experience i'll eat this food i'll drink this i'll try and sleep with these people or, or just spend all of your time in like a sort of little bubble of backpackers going around as against going out and you know i mean the great joy about being a journalist is you have the excuse to interview people and talk to people and gain access to places you may otherwise not have uh, i think that's the real i mean anyone can do that people like to tell their stories and they like it when people are interested in them so I think if you can travel in that modality, you're going to, you're going to um, gain more from it. I had a second thought. I can't remember quite what it was. Um, oh, I remember. It's um, you don't need to travel a long way to gain that same experience. During lockdown, um, I enjoyed traveling around. Uh, I was in Windsor with my mum quite a bit, but um, in London as well, because I couldn't go far. I was forced to look at my hometown or where I was living in a much slower, more attentive way. And then when we had the restrictions, I was traveling around the UK a lot. And you have this presumption that everyone in the UK feels the same or thinks the same. And, you know, the politics of the UK has demonstrated that quite recently that's clearly not true. And you can have those experiences of understanding humanity better without having to go far. You can chat to your neighbors and 
learn more and learn something interesting. It's if you ask some questions and discover things. Uh, and the same for just traveling around. I mean, the United States is a remarkable place for this. Like the blend of cultures, the variety of landscape. You know, you don't have to leave the borders of the United States to have a quite an amazing adventure culturally as well as visually. Yes, indeed. So what inspired you to become a journalist? As a kid, I actually wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a war journalist. Now, clearly, I didn't become one. Um, but what inspired you to go down this road? Because there were so many options. You seem inquisitive. You seem curious. You seem like there's a desire to understand. There's a desire to be adventurous. And maybe those are all parts of why you ended up doing what you were doing. But what was it that pushed you to do that? Um what was it that you found interesting about war journalism? What was it what was it that pulled you? Was it the sense of adventure or was it understanding stuff? I think it was the sense of adventure, the sense of speaking truth to power, mm. the sense of being in the wrong place at the right time, the sense of raw humanity. There is no bullshit when you're on the ground in a situation like that. It is pure. The feelings are pure. Everything is just happening right here, right now. And you can create change through your, through your work, right? You can touch people's lives in an instant. Danger. I mean, all of these things. Adrenaline. Um, did you end up uh, doing any reporting from any war zones? Do you spend any time in it? Any... I, I, I've never been to a war zone. You know, I don't think it's something that is necessarily uh, something you need to tick off in life. Right? Yeah. Right. So you've done it. I've not. I've been to places that are in conflict, near conflict, um, like you know Donbass. There was intermittent conflict going on whilst I was there. Um, I've been. I, I'm in the Army Reserve, so I've been to places where there is. Um, like military hardware and things going on, but never in a conflict zone. When I speak to my friends who have done it, I don't necessarily know if that's something I need to know about myself. I think, yeah. I think nobody comes back from a war zone without some form of trauma, uh, particularly mm. if they, they've seen that kind of level of conflict going on. And I think, I think there's often an, a, a romanticized notion of it and a sort of a, a bit of a, for you know, I'm not saying this is true of everybody. Uh, and I think uh, for some, for some people, there's a sort of addictiveness to it, like they want to keep returning back. Um, I'm glad that there are people out there who are who are doing that reporting and and who are doing that work. Um, it's not something that I necessarily need to know if I if I'm capable of coping with. Mm. Um, and I, I think you know the the things that you touched on there about the sort of speaking truth to power. What I find really really rewarding about travel journalism or, or journalism journal, like I write features and. Uh, the stuff I do for the BBC is less travel, uh, although from our own correspondent is based around travel. Um, it's about having the chance to think about something and then share that with other people. So you, you can have influence through it, maybe not a huge amount. Uh, you know, I write for the Telegraph. It's not the demographic that I sit in as a readership. It tends to be a bit older, uh, more small-c conservative, um, and to be able to write things in that newspaper that may give people a different perspective, what's it like to travel as a person of colour, what are the challenges and, and insights that I can reveal, pros and cons, that might help people develop a bit more insight and empathy. So that's one of the things that I enjoy about journalism. Uh, travel journalism, you get some cool free trips, you know, like through PR, and end up living a bit of a billionaire lifestyle on a student budget. That's pretty good. Um, but also just the... When I'm traveling as a journalist, I, I have it forces me to practice my curiosity, my inquisitiveness, and my questioning. And you pay attention to things more in a way that you don't always necessarily when you're just traveling through a place um, for experience, because you're having to think about what are the what are the what are the essences of the story pieces I'm going to tell when I return. You, you 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 note things. I mean, the risk, of course, then is you just see everything through your own lens and you're just reinterpreting that, which uh, 
is why I think it's important to have a lot of diversity in travel journalism. Otherwise, you only see the world through, uh, well, in travel journalism in the UK, a white lens. And I think that's why having diversity of journalists is, is good, because it stops you just falling back into tropes. Mm. Well, what, do you, what do you think about what's going on in Ukraine? I mean, because you've been there. Yeah. You know, you've experienced the people <clears throat> on both sides. You, 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 you know, I talk for myself here. I just turn on the news and, and, and I'm being fed what I'm being fed, right? But you have, I would imagine, a different perspective. I mean, Ukraine's an incredible country. It's physically beautiful. It's got a real variety and diversity to it. Um, there was a real sense of excitement in that country. It's like somebody that's come out of an abusive relationship. When they had the revolution of dignity in 2014, they effectively threw off the shackles of the long arm of Russian control, manipulating the country and extensive corruption and a police state. In, in, in the final month of um, the uh, Euromedan protests, as they were, um, Yunikovic sent thugs, literally released people from prison to go and beat people up, um, uh, terrorise them in order to stop them protesting. And all they wanted was to not have to do what Putin told them to do as a nation. That's literally all they wanted. They wanted their, their literal freedom as a democratic nation. And then uh, he sent snipers to kill people. A hundred people were killed in the last couple of weeks and uh, last couple of days. And that's effectively why his regime fell. And so they, they'd kind of been in this thing where they were controlled by these people at the top and suddenly they discovered their freedom. You know, it's almost like a, a, when you've had, weeks of terrible weather and then the sun comes out you still have that sense of freedom and joy and it was an awesome country that was really is an awesome country that is discovering itself um i met extraordinary generosity in the country whilst i was there some amazing stories of myths and legends in the mountains in the west a couple of foresters who when we got lost and couldn't find somewhere to stay gave us vodka and salo and a bed to sleep for the night um and it is everything that Putin is terrified of, which is people making choices for themselves. And, you know, there's an argument that Putin is doing this as a way to ensure his legacy and so on. But he just comes from an ideology in which um, anyone that was part of Russia or speaks Russian should be part of Russia. It's a very dangerous um, ideology that we've not seen in this power since 1939 to 1945 in Europe. Uh, maybe there was an elements of it in the Balkans in the 90s, but it's a it's a terrifying ideology. And I think you know comparing it directly to what happened in the in the uh, 30s and 40s leads us to make judgment mistakes. But I do think it's a similar approach. There's someone that just wants to control these people and 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 make them do what he wants. And um, Ukraine's a wonderful place, and it's just being destroyed. There, there, there are there are there are, there are people who just like I just want to get on with my lives and and you're you're destroying my town and killing my family. Uh, there is there is absolutely no justification for what he's done. There's yeah, it's pure wrongness and the way the Ukrainians have responded and Zelensky as a leader has been just remarkable and inspiring. Do you know any Ukrainians? Yeah, I've got a few friends of. of um, a uh, journalist who looked after me whilst I was there. She's looking after Lise Doucet, the international correspondent for the BBC there, chief international correspondent. The guy that showed me around the mountains in 2018, the guide, he'd fought in the Donbass conflict and was trying to get his life back together. He is not going to be leaving Ukraine if there's a chance to defend his country. Um, the guy that took me to Crimea, he's trying to work out a way to be safe. Um, you know, the lady who worked for the UN who took me down to see how Donbass was rebuilding itself after the Russian-backed invasion in 2014. She's in Kiev with her family, trying to find a way to be safe. You know, these are, you know, it's, it's very, there's a lot talked about, like, how we don't view it in the same way as, as what happened in Syria. The difference is I didn't know people in Syria. You know, th these are people that I know. So it feels a lot rawer to me. Mm. They're safe for now, the ones I've been speaking to. They're okay for now. Um, and I just hope that it continues like that. So as you were talking about Ukraine, remember how I I I, 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 I said to you that when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, a journalist, a war journalist, because I wanted 
the pureness, the pure reality that so many of us don't don't live, right? You don't have to be a war journalist to get that pureness, right? But sometimes when you're completely in the moment, that is when you are in your pure sense of your own humanity, right? And as you were sharing your stories about being in Ukraine, about knowing journalists who are there right now, I had chills, right? Because here I am in Los Angeles. I assume you're in London. No one's shooting at us. No one is stopping us from going to a restaurant to, to eat. No one is stopping us from living our lives. Yet you actually know someone who is currently under attack. And that sharpens the mind, right? That takes all the bullshit. I'll talk for myself. That takes all the bullshit that I surround myself with and cuts it all away. You know someone who is currently under attack. And that is chilling. And that is sobering. And that, on some level, is galvanizing. because. You can't turn your head, I'll say it again, when you know someone who is under attack, right? And I don't know, maybe I'm waffling, but it's just the art, the act of going out into the world as a journalist, as a traveler, as a filmmaker, and connecting, not necessarily in a war zone, it sharpens the mind. All the bullshit gets cut away and you're in the moment. And you determine how you use that moment. Do you use that moment to touch people's lives, right? By creating a, an article that, that inspires or by creating a film that inspires. And I think that you do because when you're in that moment, you have no choice but to do that because you are in the most purest form of your humanity. I literally don't know if what I said made any sense, but I just, I don't know. Well, yeah, I think um, trying to find ways to, um, it's very easy to get wrapped up in the, the minutiae of your daily life. Like, have I like, planning to go and watch the rugby on the weekend? Although you don't want to dismiss all that kind of stuff because if I speak to my friends from, uh, I, I wouldn't be speaking to them about this right now, but you know, they want to relish the good things in life. So you can't always just feel guilty about what you are doing because that's, that's just as valid in your life, but it's trying to take away the things that don't bring you joy. That are kind of di distraction or prestige things or status things that don't give you that, um, uh, sense of self but what, what what i do find with the with the travel is the uh, the more arduous you make it and more interesting the conversations you have and the more you dig into things the more you do get that sense of is it a, i guess it's a sense of flow i think maybe that's what you're talking about and that you know um, when people talk about their time in conflict and i speak to my peers from the army who've been you know had to had to be in combat because that was what their job involved at that time and, you know, they talk about that, that, you know, you are very much in the moment and you don't think about anything else. Um, I don't think I ever quite get to that through my journalism or my writing, but I do find moments of um, extraordinary clarity and extraordinary power when someone shares with me a story of great depth and meaning to them. You know, when they, when I was speaking to Anna, when she was telling me about the revolution of dignity and, you know, the people being killed and what it meant for the Ukrainians, it was very much a moment of, uh, immediate connection in which I wasn't worried about uh, we've got to make sure we get the train to Lviv tonight you know that kind of stuff just fades away um, so perhaps perhaps that's you know maybe this is being over ambitious about the power of journalism or the importance of what I do but being able to have those kind of connections with people and um, witnessing their stories and then being able to pass them on um, you know I guess that's that that gives me a sense of feeling that I'm doing something valuable, maybe? 100%. Definitely. 
one of the first things I'm going to do when we finish this conversation is I'm going to Google you and read some of your <laughs> articles and give you five stars. <laughs> so, so I have a, I have a, I have a question. Have you ever been on the Trans-Siberian Railroad? I've not. I've been I've been on railways in um, Russia, uh, all through that part of Europe. Um, I did take the train, the same train that um, Lenin, not the very same train, Lenin took from um, from Helsinki to St. Petersburg. Uh, so, but I've not been on the Trans Siberian. Have you? Yeah, I have. I have. But my point is, what is the longest train journey you've ever been on? It must have just been one of the ones in India. There's some pretty good train journeys in India. Now, okay. train journeys are great, great opportunities. They're lovely things to do, aren't they? But, but you see, this is my point. I feel, as we've been having this conversation, that we're just on the train journey. Mm. We could, if you and I had met on the Trans-Siberian tra- Railroad, or we'd met uh, on an Indian train, because I know what Indian trains are like, we would be having this conversation. I mean, really, we would. I mean, yeah, okay, we maybe like, oh, my God, what are we doing in India on this train? Or well, it's freezing out there in the Trans-Siberian Railway. But at base, we would be having the same conversation. I wouldn't know who you were. You wouldn't know who I was. And whatever happened, happened. And I don't know. I don't know why I said that. But I just felt like we were on this Trans-Siberian Railway together, traveling to – I went from um, – I can't remember where I went. I ended up in Beijing. But uh, it's just a beautiful thing. I say this sometimes on the podcast and sometimes I don't. But I just can't control myself right now. It's like a beautiful thing just to connect, right? How long was that, that train journey? Did you, how many, did you have many conversations like this on that train journey? You know journey? what? I had a conversation with a Dutch psychotherapist. Amazing. who I happen to be rooming with on the Trans-Siberian rail, uh, rail, Railroad journey. And I never forgot that journey and, and that conversation. And I spoke to him about a relationship issue that I was having all those years ago. And I never forgot it. Hmm. And I don't, I mean, I don't know who, the, I, I don't know what happened to him. He doesn't know what happened to me, but that conversation, that connection never left me. And maybe that's why I love spontaneous conversations. My shows are all about spontaneous conversations. This is about spontaneous conversations. It's just the pureness of who you are, right? The pureness of who I am. And we'll meet on a train, even though we're not on a train. And we'll have this conversation. And who knows where it goes? But I think conversation, my- it takes practice, though, doesn't it? Like, not like... I think when I first travelled, I didn't have that same capability to start conversations as easily. I think there's many people that feel intimidated when they travel because they say, well, I'm not gregarious, I'm not outgoing. Um, and I think you can develop those skills of conversation. Um, and I think people, friend, uh, friends, acquaintances, relatives, worry that they don't have enough interesting things to talk about. But actually, the interesting Thing in most conversationists is being able to ask good questions and that's something that you can definitely uh practice and not being comfortable with the anxiety of not being good at it in the first place that's not quite the right right way to put it but putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and traveling on your own forces you into that i think this is one of the shames about having smartphones because it's easy to retreat into a smartphone um, which i'm sure you like me didn't have when you first started traveling yeah. um, so i think for those people who are interested in travel and interested in um, learning more about people. It's about being willing to strike up conversations and they, now they happen in the most unexpected of places. People will say, Oh, the people from that town or that country or that place are unfriendly. And I, you know, people say this about the French and I'm like, well, I found the French usually okay. If you, if you, if you can overcome the language barrier, um, and just be willing to ask questions rather than just demanding a croissant. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 I, what I, you're right. It takes skill, and sometimes I forget that when I started traveling, I was very shy. I had no skill. I didn't know how to connect with people, and I forced myself to go traveling by myself, where I had no choice but to connect with people. And sometimes people say to me, "Well, how on earth do you connect with someone so quickly?" I mean, like, I feel like you and I have known each other for 30 years, 
that we've only known each other for 45 minutes or however mm-hmm. long it's been, right? The way to connect with someone is simply to find something that is common between the two of you. And once you find that common thing, you, you start talking about that. And trust me, as you know probably better than I do, it mushrooms from there. But you've just got to find that one thing. Just find that one thing. It's like whenever I travel, I always say to people, specifically if they're English or European, which football team do you support? Generally, they love football and they tell me. And the conversation just goes from there because we both love football. So I'll give you an interesting anecdote from that. I was in northern Uganda uh, on the same journey with my friend that was walking the Nile. And I'd, I'd gone there to write an article for one of the what are the newspapers? That one. So that article's in, uh, framed, okay. um, and and one for a magazine. And I noticed this really odd thing that in every single town we went to, there was this uh, uh, quite quite sad uh, impact on the young men of every single town that we went to. It was this. I mean, it was a legacy of colonialism. Um, it was causing great suffering and sadness in every town that we went to, but it only affect, afflict, afflicted the young men. Uh, and the, the great tragedy was they were they were all Arsenal fans, every single one of them, these poor young men who hoped in 2014 that Arsenal would eventually become a good team. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, there were lots of young men wearing uh, wearing football shirts, but it's a very odd fact that most of them wore Arsenal shirts. For those that don't know, Arsenal is a North London football team. Um, and I, it made me be curious. So I just started asking people, why do you support Arsenal? It turns out that the reason is, is that when the Premier League went international in 2000-ish, Arsenal were a great team. They had this team that went on an unbeaten run. I don't know a huge amount about football, I'd like to point out. But it was a, you know, as you say, it's a really easy conversation starter. And at that time, Arsenal also had a lot of black footballers. Uh, so Campbell, uh, I'm just going to, I'm not even going to pretend that I know about football, but they had a load of bl- uh, black footballers. So if these young black men in Uganda, they looked at the screen and went, those are people like me, I'll support that team. 14 years later, Arsenal weren't such a good team, but these young men still supported them. Uh, and then from there, I was able to start other conversations. With them. You know, what's life like living in northern Uganda? You know, how do you afford these football shirts? This is this is this season's football shirt. How did you do that? And being able to start these conversations. So if you can find a, 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 a route in, then you learn some really interesting insights. Uh, and, uh, and in that I, case, you, know, you, just, you, you just reminded me, I was in Peru. And I got into a taxi, this was many years ago, and I thought that the taxi driver was going to kidnap me. So I was like, how am I going to stop this guy from kidnapping me? I was like, talk to him about football. So I started talking to him about football and we became friends. I mean, probably he wasn't going to kidnap me anyway, right? But it was a way in to like make myself feel connected with this guy in my young head. I was like, he's going to kidnap me. If I become a friend, if I become friendly with him because of football, he won't kidnap me. So it's just find that one thing, you know, and, and, and magic can happen from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then just asking them questions about themselves. That's the other thing that I find really goes a long way. Um, not everyone wants, you know. Not everyone wants to be interrogated, but uh, yeah, you're right. Like a, a common point of reference goes a long way. Well, who's your favourite footballer? Always works. <laughs> who's the best in the world? Ronaldo or Messi? Always, always a good conversation starter. Or Mo Salah. Or Mo Salah, yeah, indeed. I just gave <laughs> away my football team. Indeed, indeed. Don't tell me the score. I've taped it. Do not tell me the score. <laughs> I'm leaving after this to watch the game. All right, good. good. So listen, man, it was a real pleasure. It really you was. See, uh, you're a wise, kind gentleman, and uh, it's it's beautiful that I, I, we have this opportunity to chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, thank you for agreeing to to have a, to have a conversation with me uh, and for, for playing along. Who is this nut job who wants to speak to me? Doesn't even know who I am. Uh, but you know, it works. And uh, very good. And like I say, you know, conversation is a skill that requires practice, and you're clearly very good at. Uh, turning uh, anything into a good conversation, finding points of commonality and then making it interesting for other people listening in. So, you know, it's a, it's a good school you've got there, mate. Keep it up. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure. Lovely to meet you, mate. Hello, everyone. It's Leon here, a.k.a. The Kindness Guy. 
If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have